Chapter 13, The Three Sleepers. The wind never failed, but it grew gentler every day, till at length the waves were a little more than ripples, and the ship glided on hour after hour, almost as if they were sailing on a lake. And every night they saw that there rose in the east new constellations, which no one had ever seen in Narnia. And perhaps, as Lucy thought with a mixture of joy and fear, no living eye had seen at all. These new stars were big and bright, and the nights were warm. Most of them slept on deck and talked far into the night, or hung over the ship's side watching the luminous dance of the foam thrown up by their bows. On an evening of startling beauty, when the sunset behind them was so crimson and purple and widely spread that the very sky itself seemed to have grown larger, they came in sight of land on their starboard bow. It came slowly nearer, and the light behind them made it look as if the capes and headlands of this new country were all on fire. But presently they were sailing along its coast, and its western cape now rose up astern of them, black against the red sky and sharp as if it were cut out from cardboard and they could see better what this country was like. It had no mountains, but many gentle hills with slopes like pillows. An attractive smell came from it, what Lucy called a dim, purple kind of smell, which Edmund and Rents thought were rot, but Caspian said, I know just what you mean. They sailed on a good way, past point after point, hoping to find a nice deep harbor, but had to content themselves in the end with a wide and shallow bay. Though it had seemed calm out at sea, there was, of course, surf breaking on the sand, and they could not bring the Don Treader as far in as they would have liked. They dropped anchor a good way from the beach and had a wet and tumbling landing in the boat. The Lord Roop remained on board the Don Treader. He wished to see no more islands. All the time that they remained in this country, the sound of the long breakers was in their ears. Two men were left to guard the boat, and Caspian and the others inland, but not far before it was too late for exploring and the light would soon go. But there was no need to go far to find an adventure. The level valley which lay at the head of the bay showed no road or track or sign of habitation. Underfoot was fine, springy turf dotted here and there with low, bushy growth which Edmund and Lucy took for Heather. Eustace, who was really rather good at botany, said it wasn't, and he was probably right. It was something of very much the same kind. When they had gone less than a bow shot from the shore, Journey and said, Look, what's that? And everyone stopped. Are they great trees? said Caspian. Towers, I think, said Eustace. It might be giants, said Edmund in a lower voice. The way to find out is to go right in among them, said Reepicheep, drawing his sword and pattering off ahead of everyone else. I think it's a ruin, said Lucy, when they had gone a good deal nearer, and her guess was the best so far. What they saw now was a wide oblong space, flagged with smooth stones and surrounded by gray pillars, but unroofed. And from end to end of it ran a long table laid with rich crimson cloth that came down nearly to the pavement. On either side of it were many chairs of stone, richly carved and with silken cushions upon the seats. But on the table itself there was set out such a banquet as have never been seen. Not even when Peter the High King kept his court at Caer Paravel. There were turkeys and geese and peacocks. There were boar's heads and sides of venison. There were pies shaped like ships under full sail or like dragons and elephants. And there were ice puddings and bright lobsters and gleaming salmon. There were nuts and grapes, pineapples and peaches, pomegranates and melons and tomatoes. There were flagons of gold and silver and curiously wrought glass and the smell of the fruit and the wine blew toward them like a promise of all happiness. I say, said Lucy. They came nearer and nearer, all very quietly. But where are all the guests? asked Eustace. We can provide that, sir, said Rince. Look, said Edmund sharply. They are actually within the pillars now and standing on the pavement. Everyone looked where Edmund had pointed. The chairs were not all empty. At the head of the table, 
and in the two places beside it there was something, or possibly three somethings. What are those? asked Lucy in a whisper. It looks like three beavers sitting at the table. Or a, a huge bird's nest, said Edmund. It looks more like a haystack to me, said Caspian. Reepicheep ran forward, he jumped on a chair, and then onto the table, and ran along it, threading his way as nimbly as a dancer between jeweled cups, pyramids of fruit, and ivory salt cellars. He ran right up to the mysterious gray mass at the end, peered, touched, and called out, These will not fight, I think! Everyone now came close, and saw what, he, what sat in those three chairs, and it was three men. Though hard to recognize as men, till you looked closely. Their hair, which was gray, had grown over their eyes till it almost concealed their faces, and their beards had grown over the table, climbing round and intertwining plates and goblets as brambles entwine a fence, until all mixed in one gray mat of hair, they flowed over the edge and down to the floor. And from their heads, the hair that sprang over the backs of their chairs, so that they were like, they were wholly hidden. In fact, the three men were nearly all hair. "'Dead?' said Caspian. "'I think not, sire,' said Reepicheep, lifting up one of the hands of the tangled hair in his two paws. "'This one is warm, and his pulse beats.' Well, "'This one, too, and this,' said Dridian. "'Why, they're only asleep,' said Eustace. "'It has been a long sleep, though,' said Edmund, "'to let their hair grow like this.' "'It must be an enchanted sleep,' said Lucy.' I felt the moment we landed on this island, it was full of magic. <gasps> Do you think we have perhaps come here to break it? We can try, said Caspian, and began shaking the nearest of the three sleepers. For a moment, everyone thought he was going to be successful, for the man breathed hard and muttered, I'll go eastward no more, out oars for Narnia. But he sank back almost at once into a yet deeper sleep than before. That is, his heavy head sagged a few inches lower towards the table, and all efforts to rouse him again were useless. With the second, it was much the same. We're born to live like animals. Get to the east while you have a chance, lands behind the sun, and sank down. And the third only said, Mustard, please, and slept hard. Oars out for Narnia, eh? said Drinian. Yes, said Caspian. You are right, Drinian. I think our quest is at an end. Let's look at their rings. Yes, these are their devices. This is the Lord Revelion. This is the Lord Argos. And this, the Lord Mavermore. But we can't wake them, said Lucy. What are we to do? Oh, begging your majesty's pardon and all, said Rince, but why not fall too while you're discussing it? We don't see a dinner like this every day. Not for your life, said Caspian. That's right, that's right, said several of the sailors. Too much magic about here. The sooner we're back on board, the better. Depend upon it, said Reepicheep. It was from eating this food that these three lords came by a seven years sleep. I wouldn't touch it to save my life said Drinian. Well, the light's coming uncommon quick, said Reinalf. Back to ship, back to ship, muttered the men. I really think, said Edmund, they're right. We can decide what to do with the three sleepers tomorrow. We daren't eat the food, and there's no point in staying here for the night. The whole place smells of magic and danger. I am entirely of King Edmund's opinion, said Reepicheep. As far as concerns the ship's company in general, but I myself will sit at this table till sunrise. Why on earth? said Eustace. Because, said the mouse, this is a very great adventure, and no danger seems to me so great that of knowing when I get back to Narnia that I left a mystery behind me through fear. I'll stay with you, Reap, said Edmund. And I, too, said Caspian. And me, said Lucy. And then Eustace volunteered also. This was very brave of him, because never having read of such things, or even heard of them till he joined the Don Treader, made it far worse for him 
than for the others. I beseech your majesty, began Drinian. No, no, my lord, said Caspian. Your place is with the ship, and you have had a day's work while we five have idled. There was a lot of argument about this, but in the end, Caspian had his way. As the crew marched off to the shore in the gathering dusk, none of the five watchers, except perhaps Reepicheep, could avoid a cold feeling in their stomach. They took some time choosing their seats at this perilous table. Probably everybody, everyone, had the same reason, but no one said it out loud, for it was really a rather nasty choice. One could hardly bear to sit all night next to those three terrible, hairy objects which, if not dead, were certainly not alive in the ordinary sense. On the other hand, to sit at the far end so that you would see them less and less as the night grew darker and wouldn't know if they were moving and perhaps wouldn't see them at all by two o'clock. No, it was not to be thought of. So they, they sauntered around and round the table saying, what about here? Or perhaps a bit further on? Or why not on this side? Till at last they settled down somewhere about the middle, but nearer to the sleepers than to the other end. It was about ten by now and almost dark. Those strange new constellations burned in the east. Lucy would have liked it better if they had seen the leopard and the ship and the other old friends of the Narnian sky. They wrapped themselves in their sea cloaks and sat still and waited. At first, there were some attempts to talk, but it didn't come to much. And they sat, and they sat, and all the time they heard the waves breaking on the beach. After hours that seemed like ages, there came a moment when they all knew they had been dozing a moment before, but were all suddenly wide awake. The stars were all in quite a different position from those when they had last noticed. The sky was very black, except for the faintest possible grayness in the east. They were cold, thirsty, stiff. None of them spoke now. At last, something was happening. Before them, beyond the pillars, there was a, low, there was a slope of a low hill. And now a door opened in the hillside. And a light appeared in the doorway. A figure came out. And the door shut behind it. The figure carried a light, and this light was really all that they could see distinctly. It came slowly nearer and nearer, till at last it stood right at the table opposite of them. Now they could see it was a tall girl, dressed in a single long garment of clear blue which left her arms bare. She was bareheaded, and her yellow hair hung down her back. When they looked at her, they thought they had never known what beauty meant before. The light which she had been carrying was a tall candle and a silver candlestick which she now set upon the table. If there had been any wind off the sea earlier in the night, it must have died down by now, for the flame of the candle burned as straight and still as if it were in a room with the windows shut and curtains drawn. Gold and silver on the table shone in its light. Lucy now noticed something lying lengthwise on the table, which had escaped her attention before. It was a knife of stone, sharp as steel, a cruel-looking, ancient-looking thing. No one had spoken a word yet. Then Reepicheep first, Caspian next. They all then rose to their feet because they felt she was a great lady. Travelers who have come far to Aslan's table, said the girl. Why do you not eat and drink? Madam, said Caspian, we feared the food because we thought it had cast our friends into an enchanted sleep. They have never tasted it, she said. Please, said Lucy, what happened to them? Seven years ago, said the girl. They came here in a ship whose sails were rags, and her timbers were ready to fall apart. There were others with them, sailors, and when they came to this table, one said, Here is the good place. Let us set sail and reef sail and row no longer, but sit down and end our days in peace. And the second said, No, let us re-embark and sail for Narnia and the west. It may be that Myraz is dead. 
But the third, who was a very masterful man, leapt up and said, No, by heaven, we are men and tell marines, not brutes. What should we do but seek adventure after adventure? We have not long to live in any event. Let us spend what is left in seeking the unpeopled world behind the sunrise. And as they quarreled, he caught up the knife of stone which lies there on the table and would have fought with his comrades. But it is a thing not right for him to touch. And as his fingers closed upon the hilt, deep sleep fell upon all three. Until the enchantment is undone, they will never wake. What is this knife of stone? asked Eustace. Do none of you know it? asked the girl. I, I think, said Lucy, I've seen something like it before. It was a knife like that that the white witch used when she killed Aslan at the stone table long ago. It was the same, said the girl, and it was brought here to be kept in honor while the world lasts. Edmund, who had been looking more and more uncomfortable for these last few minutes, now spoke. Look here, he said. I, I hope I'm not a coward. About eating the food, I mean, and, and I'm not sure I don't mean to be rude, but we have had a lot of queer adventures on this voyage of ours, and things aren't always what they seem. When I look in your face, I can't help believing all you say, but, but then that's just what might happen with a witch, too. How are we to know you are a friend? You can't know, said the girl. You can only believe, or not. After a moment's pause, Reba Cheep's small voice was heard. Sire, he said to Caspian, of your courtesy, fill my cup with wine from the flagon. It is too big for me to lift. I will drink to the lady. Caspian obeyed, and the mouse, standing on the table, held up a golden cup between his tiny paws and said, Lady, I pledge you. Then it fell to on cold peacock, and in a short while, everyone else followed his example. All were very hungry, and the meal, if not quite what you wanted for a very early breakfast, was excellent as a very late supper. Why is it called Aslan's Table? asked Lucy presently. It is set here by his bidding, said the girl for those who come so far. Some call this island the world's end, for though you can sail further, this is the beginning of the end. But how does the food keep? asked the practical Eustace. It is eaten and renewed every day, said the girl. This you will see. And what are we to do about the sleepers? asked Caspian. And the world from which my friends come, here he nodded at Eustace and the Pevensies, they have a story of a prince or a king coming to a castle where all the people lay in an enchanted sleep. In that story, he could not dissolve the enchantment until he had kissed the princess. But here, said the girl, it is different. Here, he cannot kiss the princess till he has dissolved the enchantment. Then, said Caspian, in the name of Aslan, show me how to set about that work at once. My father will teach you that, said the girl. Your father, said everyone. Who is he and where? Look, said the girl, turning round and pointing at the door in the hillside. They could see it more easily now, for while they had been talking, the stars had grown fainter, and great gaps of white light were appearing in the grayness of the eastern sky. And that's the end of chapter 13. And there is deep and powerful and profound imagery within this chapter that there at the beginning of the world's end, Aslan's table laid out with food fresh and new every day for all travelers who would make it that far, laid with the stone knife, the very means of Aslan's death in our very first book, 
prior to his own resurrection. The imagery, I think, cannot be avoided. This is a Eucharistic table. This is the communion of the Lord that they share. This is the banquet in God's own country, a look at the wedding supper of his son, the Lamb. It is a feast and a banquet that Scripture tells us we are invited to at the wedding supper of the Lamb where Christ himself will be united with his bride made holy, his church, all of us, to be united with Christ forever and forever. And you just can't have a wedding without a celebration, without a feast, and it is all laid out before them as we are promised that it will be laid out before us. Truly a magical place, dangerous even, as one of them noticed, but magical and dangerous in the very best of senses. Maybe miraculous, maybe holy, maybe righteous. Those are better terms for Aslan's table, the feast that is offered to them, the hope and the promise of God's feast offered to all of us.